Okay, we're gonna get started. Thank you all for coming. One final technical difficulty, the clicker. Try again. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you all for coming. Those of you in Zoom land, thank you for joining. Um, this will be recorded as well. Um, so anyone you know who wanted to attend wasn't able to, you can let them know. We'll be sending the link around. So we want to thank Dr. Dan Libby um, for coming out. He came all the way out from California um, to give this lecture. So um, please join me in welcoming him to our campus um, to talk about mindful resi resilience for military leadership. I'm going to give you um, Dr. Libby's bio and then and he will um, come on up and, um, and take over. So Dr. Libby is a founder and executive director of the Veterans Yoga Project. He is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in the mindful integration of evidence-based psychotherapies and complementary and alternative medicine practices for the treatment of PTSD and other psychological and emotional distress in active duty military and veterans. As a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University's Department of Psychiatry and the VA's Mental Illness Research and Education Clinical Center, Dan conducted research investigating the physiological correlates of mindfulness meditation, as well as the first epidemiological investigation of complementary and alternative medicine in VA PTSD treatment programs. He is also the former director of clinical services for the Starlight Military Rehabilitation Program and has taught mindfulness and yoga to hundreds of veterans and active duty service members. So with that, I will hand this over to Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning. Thank you, or I'm sorry, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here and for welcoming me. Uh, as Leanne said, my name is Dan Libby. I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit uh, about mindful resilience. Um, and in particular, uh, these are our objectives today. Um, so just, uh, just to rewind a little bit about me again, I'm uh, not really don't have any military experience myself. I'm a clinical psychologist who has studied trauma, right? Studying stress and trauma and studying the psychophysiology of stress and trauma and how does stress get underneath the skin to uh, create or exacerbate disease? Um, how does it get, you know, into our minds and uh, create mental illness or exacerbate mental illness? And so today, um, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about stress and trauma, but I wanna try to talk about it maybe in a different way and maybe provide a unique perspective on stress and trauma. And in order to uh, do that, um, we also need to understand a little bit about like, what's the opposite of that, right? What's the opposite of stress and trauma, right? What is resilience? What is thriving? What is living in alignment with your values and goals look like? And what we'll really do is look at how do these tools um, help us with those, those things. So uh, I put a definition here of mindful resilience, right? There's a lot of definitions of resilience and a lot of people are sick of the word resilience and now you've got, you know, warrior toughness and you've got all these different programs that are designed to create and build resilience. And so there's a lot of ways to look at that. One way is to look at it as resilience is about sort of getting back up when you get knocked down, right? It's about bouncing back. It's about, uh, you know, falling and doing what you need to get back to where you were. Um, but really what a, I think a more uh, appropriate version of resilience is one where we don't go back to where we were, because really you can never go back to where you were, right? It's really about how do I live even more in alignment with my values and goals? How do I find even more mission and purpose in my life, um, regardless of the trauma or, or uh, because of the trauma or because of the stress? Um, but in order to stay uh, focused on our values and goals, um, we need tools, right? And to me, that's really what resilience is about. It's just about allowing us the ability to control our own minds, to control our own bodies um, in effort of, you know, whatever our particular values and goals are. Um, so I also put the, um, uh, the definition that I stole from the website on the Warrior Toughness Program, right? So I did a little research looking at, this is the new, the new uh, initiative uh, in the Navy. And the idea is that uh, they're teaching a warrior mindset. 
And the idea, I think, and one of the differences maybe between this and resilience is here they're really talking about focusing on peak performance on what happens in the most stressful time. Um, and it's not really just about coping with it, but how do you excel, right? How do you um, be the best that you can be even in the worst of times, right? And even in the most boring of times, right? So uh, for what that's worth. So what I would like to do is um, provide a slightly different understanding of stress and trauma. And uh, I'll start by using an example of um, the most common traumatic event out there is a car accident, right? Because it happens all the time. And people get into car accidents all the time. Um, but if you look at all traumatic events, they can all be defined by three things, right? All traumatic events lack three basic uh, characteristics at the time. The first is safety. Right? So if you think about a car accident, there's a lack of safety, right? People get hurt, they die all the time. There's also a lack of predictability, right? Because you can't predict what your car is going to do. You can't predict what the other car is going to do. And there's a lack of control, right? So you can't control your car or the, other control, or the other car. So what we can understand is that traumatic events by definition, right? And if you look at the basic scientific research, right? If you look at what underlies stress, right? There's a lack of safety, predictability, and control or a safe, predictable, and controllable environment, right? S-P-A-C-E. Right, so we use the acronym SPACE to help us understand that all traumatic events and all stressful events, if you think about like COVID and the world pandemic, right, is there a lack of safety? Yeah. Is there a lack of predictability? Yeah. Is there a lack of control? Yeah. Right. That's why there's a level of stress and for some people trauma around the current world events. Now, for those of us, when we wear a mask, we get inoculated with the vaccine. All of a sudden we're exerting some level of control, right? And all of a sudden we're not as stressed out about it. Right? So if you can think about any stressful event in your own life, right, you can look at it and all of them were going to be marked by these three things. There's going to be a lack of safety in some way, a lack of predictability and a lack of control. But what we know also is that for some people during that traumatic or stressful event, there tends to be a lack of safety, predictability and control internally as well. Right. So we were just talking about a safe, predictable and controllable external environment. But really, what do we talk about when we're talking about mindfulness and self-reflection and yoga, right? We're talking about the internal environment, my thoughts, my body, my physical sensations. And what sometimes happens for people when they are in the midst of a stressful or traumatic event is they start to lose safety, predictability, and control in their internal environment. So I've had a vet tell me in not so many words that, hey, doc, I couldn't predict and I couldn't control the fact that I projectile vomited the first time I had to pick up a body part. It sure as hell didn't feel safe. And I tried like hell to keep it in, right? Or somebody at the time of a, a big stressful event just sort of goes and cowers in the corner and they're just sort of like frozen, right? They get that fight flight and they go into that freeze response, right? And, I, and what happens, I've lost control. This isn't how I predicted that I would react. It's not how I trained, right? It's not how the Navy trained me to react. It's not how anybody, and so I couldn't predict it and I couldn't control it at the time. I really wanted to, you know, be more effective, but I was just frozen, right? And it certainly wasn't safe. So what we know about all traumatic and stressful events is that there's a level of a lack of safety, predictability, and control externally. But what often happens is there's a lack of safety, predictability, and control internally. For people who then go on to develop post-traumatic stress, for example, what we know is this lack of exter external space persists, right? I work with lots of folks who are dealing with post-traumatic stress and you know, if they're in public, their back is to the wall, their eyes are on the exits, they're not going out in, in big crowds, right? Because the world is what? It's unpredictable, right? It's uncontrollable. You can't predict or control what other people are going to say or do. You don't feel safe, right? You're scanning rooftops for snipers, you know, you're in the middle of downtown, wherever, right? And so what we know is that when people develop post-traumatic stress symptoms, you can understand it clinically through the four symptom clusters and get the diagnosis. But when we understand it from the person's perspective, Right? What are they experiencing? They're experiencing a world that feels unsafe, that's unpredictable, and that's uncontrollable. But what's more debilitating or most debilitating about people who are dealing with post-traumatic stress, for example, is that there's a lack of safety, predictability, and control internally that persists. Right? I have these intrusive thoughts and memories and images that are unpredictable. I don't know when they're going to happen. I can't control them, and they're, they're not safe. My body, all of a sudden, my heart starts beating. I start sweating profusely. My body starts reacting in ways that are unpredictable. 
I can't control it when it happens and it doesn't feel safe. And even my behaviors, right, despite my best efforts, right, are unsafe and unpredictable and uncontrollable. I had a veteran that I worked with who um, told me a story, basically how he's driving south on the West Side Highway in you know, New York City. You're going down, right, going to the GW Bridge, and the lanes are like this, right? And there's like no shoulder. And uh, what happens is he gets cut off in traffic. And before he knows it, before I knew it, Doc, what he's done is he's sped up, gone around the guy who cut him off, cuts that guy off, comes, hits his brakes and comes to a complete stop in the middle of the West Side Highway, causing the guy who originally cut him off to come to a complete stop in the West Side Highway. He takes the bat out of the back seat of his baseball car and he smashes the guy's windshield. Happened like that, Doc, right? And can I tell you that he felt like crap about that? That he did not wake up that morning wanting to smash somebody's windshield? He did not, like, here's another example of his body and his mind, right? His behavior is being unpredictable and uncontrollable and unsafe. And we can think of a lot of what people are dealing with when they're stressed out, right? It doesn't have to be post-traumatic stress. But what happens when you get stressed out? Right, I'll speak from the eye. When I get stressed out, sometimes I, I, I stray from my values and goals, right? I snap at my kid for no really good reason, right? Because she's being a kid. Or I'm short with my wife, right? Or, right, I'm, I'm going to do things that are really not what I woke up that morning. You know, it's not what I want to do, right? I want to get along with my family and I want to, you know, do well at work and I want to do all the things that are in alignment with my values and goals. But what happens is when we get stressed out, right? You get the, the fuck it sometimes, right? And you're just like, ah, I don't care anymore. Or, right, there, we just get overloaded. And so what we know is that for all of us, when we're in that stress response, there's a lack of external safety predictability control, but there's also this lack of internal safety predictability control. And this is where I think this is what resilience is, and this is what we do at Veterans Yoga Project. So we're not going to speak too much today about let's see, the little thing there, a little Never mind. We'll try to play with that. Uh, we won't go too much on a little bit. We'll talk about crafting an external, safe, predictable, and controllable environment, right? Because it's one of the things that we can do as leaders in our own lives, in our own families, as leaders of others, right? Is that we can create a safe, predictable, and controllable environment for other people, right? When my staff is feeling safe and they know what's going to happen and they have a level of control, right? My staff gets along better. Right? We have you know, people who are able to work more effectively. Right? So part of creating space is about creating a safe, predictable, and controllable environment for others. Right? And that's, I really think, one part of leadership. But before you can get there, right, we, start to have, we have to create that safety, predictable, and control in our own bodies, right? in our own minds. And so how do we do that? Well, we practice the tools. So before we get that, I want, before we get to the tools, right, and we're, we're going to talk about mindfulness and breathing and yoga, um, but really, I want to start to help understand why and how these tools create that internal safety, predictability, and control, right? Because I can invite you all to get and take a nice deep inhale through the nose. I can predict with 100% accuracy what you're going to do next. Then take another deep inhale. This time, hold your breath for two beats and then let it out real slow. Control the exhale so that your exhale is a little bit longer, slower, deeper than your inhale. Maybe do that a couple of times. Take a deep inhale through the nose. Maybe just hold it for a beat and then see if you can make your exhale twice as long as your inhale. Keep going. A couple more rounds. Inhale. Hold it for a beat. In yoga, we do something called the ujjayi breath where we gently constrict the back of the throat making like a little ha sound so there's less air that can escape that allows you to extend your exhale. So you can do that with your mouth open or closed. So when you take a deep inhale through the nose, keep going. You can use that similar to pursed lips breathing. Right, so your breath just became a little bit more predictable and controllable. And what will happen, and maybe you start to feel something, right? Because when we start to extend our exhale longer than our inhale, maybe you notice the shift in how you feel, right? In a maybe abstract kind of way, or maybe a very concrete kind of way. 
but I would almost promise you that if you did that 10 times in a row and you really started making your exhales longer than your inhales, what happens is you actually shift your nervous system, right? The autonomic nervous system actually shifts into a place that's more vaguely mediated. And so we'll talk about what that means. And so um, one of the ways that these practices works is regulation of the autonomic nervous system. And what is the autonomic nervous system? Well, the autonomic nervous system is what regulates everything else Everything else is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system influences all of the other systems of your body, right? Your skeletal system, your muscular system, your digestive system, your, uh, your circulatory system, right? Your respiratory system, everything is influenced by the, you know, your pain levels, your mood, how well you sleep. All of this is regulated by your autonomic nervous system. So what is this autonomic nervous system? Well, the autonomic nervous system basically controls your level of energy in your body, right? So if you think about physiological arousal here on this axis, right? How much energy do you have at any particular moment, right? There are probably some days where have you ever been really hyper, right? And you're so excited, you have so much physiological that you're, it, it, you can't even get the words out, right? Or you're so anxious, right? You, you're, because physiologically you're just too amped up, right? And we've all had those experiences, you know, where you just don't have enough, you just don't have enough energy, right? When you have your hypo aroused, right? So what your autonomic nervous system does is it works to keep you in that sweet spot, right? The Goldilocks zone, right? Where our physiological energy levels, right? Are appropriate to whatever we're dealing with that in the moment, right? So if you're in a stressful situation, you sort of want that the energy levels to be up here. If you're just sort of hanging out, and, you know, with your spouse on the couch watching a movie, you're probably good being down here. Right? But it's the autonomic nervous system that allows you to be in this zone. And when you're in this zone, right, or when you're out of this zone, right, it affects other things physiologically, right? Physiology determines phenomenology. So physiologically, we are outside of the zone. And so we're going to experience changes in our thoughts, in our physical feelings and emotions, right? As well as in our behaviors. And what we know is that if you think about the thought behavior repertoire, right? So in any moment, we can have any number of thoughts, right? In any moment, we can engage in any number of behaviors, right? But when you are in hyper arousal or hypo arousal, what happens is you actually have a decrease in freedom. You only have a certain number of thoughts available to you in that moment. You only have a certain number of behaviors available to you in the moment. So not to excuse bad behavior, right? But that veteran that I worked with who smashed the, the other driver's windshield, in some way, he had no other choice. His physiology was so up here that he said he had to neutralize that threat and make sure that that driver didn't put anybody else in danger on that road, right? And it happened like that. He had almost no other choice because there was no space between stimulus and response. And so what we know is that when we're stressed out, we do, we tend to, right? We tend to focus on defense, escape, avoidance, and retaliation, right? Whether we're hyper aroused or hypo aroused, right? You sort of isolate yourself and you're in that defensive posture, right? When you're hypo aroused. And so we know that this physiology is directly related to our thought behavior repertoire. And what we also know is that many of us, Right. And many of the people that we lead, many of the people that we live with, our loved ones, and maybe even ourselves, sometimes spend our lives and might feel like we don't spend a whole lot of time in that sweet zone. That maybe we spend a lot of time engaging in behaviors and using substances to try to feel okay. Right. We all just, I want to feel okay. Right. Give me that cup of coffee in the morning. Right. Give me that Red Bull in the afternoon. Give me a couple of drinks in the evening. Right, whatever it is that we're doing, right, it, on some level, you can look at our behaviors as we're just trying to feel okay in the moment, right? And that's really comes back to how do we feel physiologically and how can we keep our autonomic nervous system in this uh, optimal arousal zone or this window of tolerance. And so, what we know is that when we start to come inside the zone, right, as our thought behavior opens up, right? So, maybe. If he had had a little bit of, if right, the vet that I was talking about, if he had had his autonomic nervous system, maybe just a little bit closer to that arousal zone sweet spot there, right? Maybe he would have had a different thought, right? Maybe he would have just flipped the guy off. Maybe he would have done, just sort of said, oh, wow, he must be in a rush, right? He would have had other thoughts available to him at that moment. 
But at the time of the, of the stress, right, the stress was so overwhelming that his thought behavior repertoire shrank, right? So part of the, the part of my uh, goal, right, for him as his clinician, part of my hope, right, in instilling resilience in others is to be able to deal with such an overwhelming stressful response while, all, while still keeping your thought behavior repertoire nice and big, right? And maybe you decide to go to avoid, escape, defend, and retaliate. Maybe you decide to smash that windshield anyway, but you're doing so because you're actually choosing to, not because you're reacting to. And for most of us, we're not going to choose to decide, right? He was not going to choose to do that. So what we know is that in the tools that we, for me, building resilience, right? Mindful resilience is about, one, being able to stay inside that optimal arousal zone, right? Even when you get cut off in traffic, right? Even when your coworker's an a-hole, right? Even when you get like triggered or poked or, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, is to be able to stay inside that optimal arousal zone so that, our, again, our thoughts and behaviors can be in alignment with our values and our goals. And also to start to widen that window of tolerance, right? So now I can tolerate more and still not become so overwhelmed that I veer off from my goals. Right. Ultimately, when we start living inside that optimal arousal zone, right now, our th now we really open up, right? Now, now we have a different mindset, maybe not thinking about ourselves all the time, right? We're really focused on service and leadership and now creating space for others, right? But first we have to be able to maybe sometimes at least uh, be able to create that safety, predictability control in our own bodies. So how do we do that? Right, because this is what I would say is what do you call mental toughness, whatever you call resilience, right? The, the challenge in life, right, is to regulate physiology because physiology is going to determine phenomenology. And so we are going to look at how do we control, right? How do we create that safe, predictable and controllable environment? Well, one of the things we do is we meditate, right? So here we get to, we're actually talking about mindfulness now. So what is mindfulness? And what is meditation? And are they the same? And there's so many different types of meditation out there. So ultimately, right, meditation, one way to understand meditation is just about attentional control, right? You can just throw mindfulness, throw the word out the window, you can throw resilience out the window, you can throw, right? It's just about controlling your attentional resources, putting your attention where you want to put your attention, when you want to put it there for as long as you want to put it there, right? I don't know about you, but for me, right? My attention is very easily like, you know, squirrel, right? Like, oh, there's a buzz in my pocket or there's a ding or right. We are, we're, our, our attention is constantly trying to be hijacked, right? I mean, it's the attention economy now, right? Everybody wants your attention. And a lot of failures of resilience are about this inability to keep my mind focused, like where to put my attention where I want to put my attention. The practice of mindfulness, right? As it's usually taught, is about picking something to put your attention on, right? So I'll invite you guys to bring your attention right to the tips of your nostrils, right where the breath exits and enters the body. And what we'll do is we'll meditate on those sensations, right? On just feeling what is, right? Just noticing the sensations right there at the tips of your nostrils. And for the next few breath cycles, every time you notice that you're thinking about something else, that your mind has wandered, just bring your attention back to the sensations right there at the tips of your nostrils. And isn't it amazing that I can invite all of you to do that? And every one of us, right? We can all do it. We can bring our attention to a place. And an amazing thing is, is that none of us can sustain it there, right? We only did that for what, about 10, 15 seconds, right? I'm going to guess that most of us had other thoughts in our mind, right? Because that's what the mind does, right? Meditation is not about making your mind go blank. It's not about achieving some state of nirvana where I'm like all blissed out and, you know, reaching samadhi. Right? It's really just about noticing where your mind goes, right? So noticing, hey, I'm not focusing on this anymore and bringing it back and noticing where it goes and bring your attention back. 
And then you're, you're sitting there and you're meditating and then you've got an itch and all of a sudden you think, oh, and then I bring my attention back. And then I hear something out there and I start to think and I wonder, oh, wait, and then I bring my attention back, right? That's what the practice of meditation is. So what are we actually doing, right? Every time I notice that my mind has wandered, what, what am I doing? I'm gaining more predictability of my own self, right? I'm starting to know myself better, right? I can actually... Like, isn't it amazing that every time I try to meditate after lunch, I start thinking about cookies. Isn't that weird, right? We start to understand and know ourselves. In other words, our minds become more predictable. We start to be able to metacognate, as they say, right? We start to be able to see where our mind is. And as we notice where the mind goes, right? We learn our, about ourselves. We become more noble. So we are becoming more predictable in the mind. And then an amazing thing happens is that with just a little bit of practice, what happens is you're actually able to sustain your attention on the breath for maybe two breath cycles before you get distracted. And then maybe with a little more practice, you can sustain your attention on your breath for three breath cycles before you get distracted. Right. And over time now, right. I'm able to keep my attention where I want to keep my attention, despite the noisy neighbors and the, you know, my legs falling asleep and all these other distractions so what am I really doing? I'm strengthening the muscles. All I'm doing is strengthening my attentional, my ability to control my attentional resources, right? So in other words, our mind is becoming more predictable and more controllable. And when you have a mind that's an asset instead of a liability, anybody here have a dog? Anybody have a pet? Dogs, right? How many of your dogs are well-trained? I won't ask the opposite, then I'll assume they're all poorly trained or somewhere in the middle. But one way to understand the mind, and this is one of the ways that I will sometimes teach meditation, is it's just like training a puppy, right? Like a puppy is, right, it's designed to be hyper and to chase squirrels and to be curious about the world, right? And that's your mind. Your mind is, is supposed to be curious about the world and to think about lots of things, Right? Your mind isn't supposed to be blank all the time or just completely focused all the time, right? There has to be room for that. And just as you tell a puppy to heal, right? And you bring that puppy right back by your side and it walks with you for a second. And then what happens? It chases a squirrel and then you say heal and then it chases and it heals. And, it's the, and that's what you do for your whole life, right? But over time, as your dog gets older, right? It doesn't run away quite as much, does it? Right? It doesn't chase quite as many squirrels, but it still chases squirrels because it's still the nature of the dog to chase squirrels. And so it's the same thing with our mind. It's the nature of the mind to think and to wonder and to be curious and to explore and to ruminate and to do all of these things. And we can also train it, right? We can also train our mind to be an asset. Because again, when you look at people, uh, failures of resilience, right? When you look at people who aren't exhibiting that ability to control their selves at the time of a trauma, um, it's, it's it, part of it's the mind, right? They're, they're, they're not able to control and put their attention where they need to put their attention, right? They get caught up in whatever they get caught up in. And so part of resilience is gaining safety, predictability, and control in the mind, which is what that slide says. See who needs slides. So then there's movement, right? And most people, when they think of yoga, right? We're Veterans Yoga Project is the organization that I founded and run. And so there's a stigma that just pops up right away, right? You use the word yoga and all of a sudden we all have these preconceived notions of what that is. Um, and so I'm here to tell you, you don't even have to use the word yoga, right? Or mindfulness, right? Because all we're doing is we're just controlling our breath, controlling our minds and controlling our bodies, and so what's happening with the body, right? When we are practicing mindful movements and how is that different than just going to get your, you know, going to running or engaging in other physical exercise that isn't mindful, right? What is mindful exercise versus mindless exercise? And one of the ways to understand that, right, is one, we want to understand that our physical body right, is run by the somatic nervous system, right? We talked about the autonomic nervous system, but our somatic nervous system is half sensory nerves and half motor nerves, right? So half of our nervous system is designed to take in information, to observe, to sense, to perceive. And the other half of our nervous system is designed to move and act and, and behave and engage with the world. 
what we know, so here's a, a picture of your brain. And the part that's highlighted in pink here is your somatosensory cortex, right? And what we know about the somatosensory cortex, this is a strip of your brain tissue on the outside here, where there's a, a kind of a one-to-one -one relationship where there are parts of your body that are mapped onto your brain, right? So if you look at um, this picture, which is a little bit uh, askew, um, you can see this idea of the homunculus. And you can see here that there's not only a somatosensory cortex, but there's also a strip of brain matter called the somatomotor cortex. And so if I invite you guys to all just go ahead and give me a thumbs up with your right thumb, right? And now go ahead and just maybe wiggle that right thumb. If I had you in a brain scanner right now, what we would see right on the left side of your brain on the motor cortex is that, where's that thumb, right? There's a thumb right up there. That there's a, that little brain of tissue, little tissue, uh, piece of brain tissue there, if you had you in a brain scanner, that would light up because we would see that, right? That's what it, and at the same time, the sensory cortex would be lit up also because in order to move, you actually have to sense, right? But we could also just bring your attention into your right thumb and just try to feel what your right thumb feels like, right? Without moving it, right? It's a different thing, right? To try to feel sensation with, with movement versus without movement. Again, if we had you in a brain scanner, this little piece of the somatosensory cortex would light up, but not the motor cortex because you're not moving your thumb, All right? So what we have is a map of our physical body in our brain. And what we know is that if you look at this little homunculus thing, if you look at the parts of the body that are most represented, it's the areas of the body that have the most sensory nerve endings, right? So the tongue, the hands, the genitals, Right, these are the parts of the body that have more little folds and sulci here um, because there's a lot more fine tuning, right? They're that we can sense things really finely with our fingertips than we can with our middle back, for example, which doesn't have as much brain matter. So what we know is that we have a map of our body in our brains and that we know that over time and with, especially with physical injury and chronic pain, for example, but also with emotional pain, is that over time, your map gets a little smudged. Do you guys remember when maps actually used to be on paper, right? And you actually, like, you'd go to AAA, and you, or, or maybe you'd print it from MapQuest, you know, one generation later. But we used to have paper maps, and if you'd spilled, like, some coffee in your paper map, what happened? It got smudged, right? And you couldn't see the streets quite as clearly, right? You can see there's a neighborhood there, but you can't really see what's what. Well, something similar happens in our brains over time, right? Is that we start to lose that fine detail and our maps get smudged, right? Because we're not actually sensing our bodies very much. And with chronic pain, for example, right? Somebody who has chronic low back pain, right? If you put them in a scan scanner and say, okay, bring your attention to the right side of your lower back. If you look at their brain scanner, what's the part of the brain that actually lights up? It's not just that strip that represents the lower back, but it's also the right glutes, the right hip, the left leg, like in other words, there's not as much um, uh, definition. There's not as much fine, cute, you know the word I'm looking for, something there. Um, and so our, our maps get a little smudged. And so we know that this happens both with physical chronic pain, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure it happens also with emotional pain. Right? So if you have uh, trauma in a particular part of the body, again, you're not going to bring attention to that part of the body. Right? People have a lot of uh, difficulties with sexual side effects after being sexually assaulted. Part of that is because they actually will not spend as much mental time sensing that part of their body. So their map gets smudged. Right, And this is partly what I think also creates some, and one of the reasons or one of the ways that trauma creates illness right, and, 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 uh, and dysfunction in the body is that we start to actually have a, a smudged map so we can't sense it as well. And then the same thing happens on the motor side of the body too, right, is that we don't have the ability to move quite as precisely, right? So I might be working with a beginner, you know, a beginner yoga student, you know, maybe uh, someone who's maybe doesn't have much uh, experience, you know, engaging in physical exercise, and I might invite uh, him to go ahead and lift your right arm. He goes like this. Right. Over time, a couple of classes, lift your right arm and he lifts his right arm. Right. All of a sudden, I'm able to not, I'm able to have better finely motor control. 
right? In yoga, you do balancing postures, right? And it shows that you actually have better ability to balance. You're going to fall less in your older age, right? So in other words, what's happening when we practice mindful practices of yoga, right? Or even if you're running in a mindful way, if you're lifting weights at the gym in a mindful way where you're paying attention to not only the sensations of the breath, but paying attention to the physical body, what you're doing is you're remapping, you're driving your little Google car through the streets, right? You see the little Google cars that go through, they're mapping all the alleys now and they're mapping parking lots and they've got the whole thing mapped, right? Because they have these little Google cars going through the streets, clearing up the maps. And that's what we're doing when we're engaging in mindful awareness of bodily sensations, right? When we engage in mindful movement of the physical body, what we're doing is we're just creating clearer, stronger maps of our internal world. So our bodies become more predictable, more controllable, and more safe, right? Both sensory-wise and motor-wise. Breathing, we already mentioned breathing, right? But breathing is really the key to um, all of this. We already did the thing where we extended our exhale, right? And it allows us to bring our attention or our physiological uh, levels right inside that Goldilocks zone, right? Where now our thoughts and behaviors can be more aligned with our values and goals. Where now what we know is that the, the part of the nervous system, right? There's a part of the nervous system that evolved in humans differently than other animals or really evolved in mammals, right? So you have something called your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is one of your 12 cranial nerves that comes out of the medulla, part of your brain stem, and it goes down and innervates all of your organs. And what we know is that if we were to, for example, cut your vagus nerve, that your heart rate would jump up to about 170 beats per minute because that's your heart's like natural resting state, right? At, at rest, that's what your, your heart would do. But it's innervated by this newly evolved part of our nervous system that evolved very specifically to allow us to connect with one another, to engage in socio-affective communication. Right, because I can't actually talk to you and connect with you and put myself in your shoes. I can't try to actually get you to understand something, right? If you're too hyper aroused and you're too worried about safety and, and every little sound, or if you're too hypo aroused and you can't even give me the eye contact, right? The whole reason that we have this ability to regulate our autonomic nervous systems is so that we can actually connect and collaborate and do teamwork and cooperate so that we can achieve shared goals. Because we know that in evolutionary terms, survival is most, uh, uh, most assured, I guess, uh, when you are in, in, in safety in numbers, right? We want to affiliate. And so this is the part of the nervous system that evolved very specifically in mammals, right? In humans in particular, we have more of this prefrontal cortex, right? Which is the attentional control. So in other words, we have, like, we might be the only animals, right, that we actually can consciously take a deep inhale. We can consciously extend that exhale so that we can bring our arousal levels in a way where I can actually be present. I can actually be here, right, to connect with you to whatever it is. I'm just going to do a little time check here um, because I might uh, want to also just briefly. Well, let's do this. So um, I'm, uh, I'm an academic. I'm a head case. Um, I think that's why I like yoga, right? Because it's experiential, right? Um, all of this, great, blah, 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 right? There's so much noise in the world. We all get so much information every day that it just sort of, it just, you know, but I think it's really good information just sort of gets caught up in the whirlwind. What doesn't tend to get caught up in those same things is our own experience, right? So I'm going to invite you to join me for just, and you don't even have to sit up straight or anything, but I'll invite you to do that because it probably works better. I'm going to see if we can just take maybe seven minutes tops, right? And actually I might go a little longer than that. We'll see. Um, but I'm going to um, just guide you through um, just a simple exercise where we're going to first notice the breath, right? Because breath awareness is the first thing. So we just have to even notice where we're breathing. 
Um, and then we'll start to engage in what we call a three-part breath, which is a full yogic breath, um, and with the extended exhale. And then I might do a little bit of an attention switching exercise where we start to notice sensations of the breath in different parts of our bodies. So I'll invite you to, um, if you'd like to, find a comfortable seated position. And by comfortable, I mean supported in general. The rule of thumb is to have your hips higher than your knees. Right? This is a good rule of thumb just in general. If you're sitting, you got low back issues when you're sitting in your chair. In general, when your hips are higher than your knees, it allows your back to have the neutral curves that it's supposed to have. Right. Whereas if you're, you're like this, this is how I sit a lot, right? And I have that curve in my lower back and then it feels all cranky and whatever. So I'd like you to find a seated position. Maybe your feet are flat in the floor. Maybe your spine is relatively straight. And I'll invite you to just give yourself permission for the next seven minutes to bring all of your attention here. All, right? all the other stuff you got in your head and all the other things you got to do, they'll still be there in seven minutes, I promise. But for the time being, as best you can, I invite you to bring all of your attention and all of your awareness right back to the tips of your nostrils. Your eyes can be open or closed. But for the next several breath cycles, just allow your attention to repeatedly return. Just to noticing what does that feel like right there at the tips of your nostrils? You're not trying to feel anything in particular. There's no right or wrong or good or bad. It's just a exercise and curiously noticing whatever it is that you notice. Not chasing sensation, not seeking sensation, but just noticing what you notice. And at the same time, we're, we're accepting and we're welcoming all the other distractions, right? We're noticing those distractions, the thoughts, and then just bring your attention back to your breath in this moment. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. As you continue to breathe, I'm gonna invite you to take your hands down to right where your, maybe the fingertips are touching your belly button. So your hands are gonna be on your lower belly so that they're not touching the ribs, but maybe the fingertips again are just sort of hovering around the belly button area, the navel center. Just continue to breathe normally as best you can. So when we pay attention to the breath, we can either engage with the breath and we can purposefully breathe and control the breath, or we can just see and try to relinquish control of the breath. What happens if you pay attention to the breath, but don't actually engage in the breathing? Can you just notice and watch your body as it breathes itself? Some days this is easier than others. But what you might notice is that as you watch the breath, maybe you're noticing the sensations at the tips of your nostrils, you'll also notice that there's a little movement of your hands. Right, that the, move, the hands move slightly outward and away from the spine with each inhale and slightly inward towards the spine on the exhale. And what I'm going to invite you to do now is to exaggerate that movement. See if you can take a big belly exhale where you press that belly button all the way back to the front of the spine so that you can exhale all the way to empty. And then inhale just to inhale to feel that sense of expansion through the belly, low back and side waist. And then again, exhaling actively. So we're leaving the chest relatively still and seeing if most of the movement can come from the movement of the belly, pressing out for the inhale, expanding three-dimensionally for the inhale. And then seeing if we can extend that exhale by gently yielding the belly button back towards the front of the spine. So this is breathing space number one, okay? We're gonna call this breathing space number one. And now I'm going to invite you to leave breathing space number one and take your hands to breathing space number two, which is the bottom half of your rib cage. 
underneath the breast line, but on top of the ribs. And again, you could have them in the front ribs. You could even have them in the side or the back ribs. But see if you can come back to that noticing breath. So don't try to breathe, but see if you can just become aware of the breath. And notice if there's any movement of the hands. There may be a lot of movement, there may be very little or even no movement. And then after you take your next full deep exhale, when you inhale, first fill breathing space number one, and then wait till you fill breathing space number one until you start to fill breathing space number two. And then exhale all the way to empty. So we're gonna exhale all the way to empty. We're gonna see if we can fill breathing space number one first. And only then that we feel that three-dimensional expansion through breathing space number two. And then we can just exhale all the way to empty. Maybe try that a couple of times at your own pace. And then when you're ready, I'm gonna invite you to again, release that. And we're gonna take our hands now to breathing space number three, which is the top half of the rib cage. I like to sometimes stick my thumbs in my armpits and fan my fingers across the collarbones. You can also just take your hands and put them in opposite armpits like you're you know, like, like that. And then come back to that resting, normal, just noticing breath. I'm not trying to feel anything in particular, but just notice what you notice. Notice any movement of the hands. Maybe noticing a subtle expanding and contracting of what we call breathing space number three. And then keeping your hands there, go ahead and exhale all the way to empty. Inhale in three parts. First, breathe into breathing space number one. Then let the expansion come to breathing space number two. And then to three. And then exhale all the way to empty. And again, you can take your hands back to wherever is most comfortable for you on your body or not, but See if you can now take yourself through a few of these three part breaths. So we exhale all the way to empty. And as you inhale, you feel that three dimensional expansion first through breathing space number one, and then through breathing space number two, and then through breathing space number three. And then if you wanna see if you can't use that gentle constriction in the back of the throats, just gently squeezing the back of the throat so that the air can escape a little bit more slowly. Your exhale can become longer than your inhale. At any point, come back to a normal resting breath, but see if you can do a few rounds of this where we can really take a full three-part inhale. And a long, what they call a victorious breath exhale. And what you'll notice is your mind has been distracted by lots of different things as we're doing this exercise. And each time you bring your attention back to the exercise, you're strengthening that muscle in the prefrontal cortex. And each time you lengthen that exhale, it allows, actually creates the conditions to allow you to concentrate a little bit more fully. And now that we've got this nice deep breath flowing, you can keep your hands again, wherever is most comfortable for you. I'm gonna invite you to continue breathing, but now I'm gonna invite you to change your attention and bring all of your attention into your right nostril. As you take the next inhale, notice the, the sensations in your right nostril. 
Cross over the bridge of your nose with your awareness and bring your attention to the left nostril when you do your next exhale. Stay in the left nostril as you inhale. Cross over the bridge of the nose, bring your attention to the right nostril, exhale. Good, inhale right. Crossing over, noticing left. Inhale left. Cross over, exhale right. Now we're not really breathing one nostril at a time. It's just an exercise in noticing just the right nostrils as you take a big three-part inhale. Cross over the bridge of the nose and take that long exhale, just noticing the sensations in your left nostril. Inhale left. Cross over, exhale right. Let's do one more round together. Inhale right. Cross over, exhale left. Inhale left. Cross over, exhale right. And just do a couple more rounds of this at your own pace. When you're done, just come back to a normal resting breath, noticing all of the sensations that you experience in the moment. Taking all the time you need in the next 20 seconds or so to complete your three-part breath. Instead of ending the practice, I'll invite you to continue the practice even as you move through your day. At any point, we can bring our attention right back to the sensations of the breath. At any point, we can allow the breath to be deep and full and extend that exhale. And what we know is that's going to allow us to have better control of our own minds and bodies. So we know that these tools... We're not going to talk too much about yoga nidra, which is another of the five tools that we use uh, at the Mindful Resilience Program, which is really a guided meditation of the body. Um, uh, and we're not going to spend too much time talking about gratitude, but that's the fifth of the five tools, right? So when we cultivate an attitude of gratitude, we're not missing something, right? We're not seeking something else. So that part of the brain that's always active, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain um, is able to be quieted when we take that moment of gratitude for, uh, for whatever it is that we can find gratitude for in that moment. So in these ways, right, we can understand that these mind-body tools create an internal sense of safety, predictability, and control, right? Where our minds, our bodies, right, our thoughts, our emotions, physiology starts to become a little bit more predictable, right? And it becomes a little bit more controllable. However, well, let me bring it back. So in teaching these tools to others, right, and using these tools, I think, for leadership, Right. Part of the thing we have to understand is that my student is not going to do this breathing practice if they are if they're not in the moment. In other words, is anyone here? Does anybody here ever? How many of you have a regular meditation practice? 
Okay. Have you, well, my other next line is usually, how many of you stretch the definition of the word regular? But I'll withdraw that question instead. Uh, I'll ask, how many of you have ever gone into the middle of a busy intersection, sat down in the middle of that intersection and tried to meditate? I'm guessing nobody's ever done that, right? Um, and for the most part, right, rewind that, not for the most part. For many of the people that I work with, they're in the middle of the intersection all the time, right? I know for me, sometimes I'm in the middle of the intersection, right? Even if I'm just sitting at home on my couch or at my dining room table, right? Sometimes we are in the middle of the intersection. When we are in the middle of the intersection, we can't learn these tools, right? We can't really land. We can't actually be present to practice that deep breath or to really be present with it if I'm not in a safe and predictable and controllable external environment, right? So in other words, my ability to learn the tools that create an internal safe, predictable, and controllable environment depends on my ability to learn those tools, which depends on learning those tools in an environment that is safe, predictable, and controllable. And so most of the leadership skills that we learn, right, all these different leadership, you know, uh, approaches that are out there, you can look at them and a lot of them are, you know, what you're doing is you're providing safety, predictability, and control for the people that you work for, right? I know as a psychologist, right, if I'm doing one-on-one -on -one therapy with someone, I'm not gonna have my client come into my office and have them sitting across from me with their back to the door, right? Because if I'm, which is how most offices are, right? You come in, I'm looking at the door, and then as you're talking to me, your back is to the door the whole time. And on some level, you don't even have to have post-traumatic stress. On some level, part of your consciousness is paying attention to what's back there or listening for the sound of the door opening or, right? And so now that part of consciousness isn't here with me in my therapy, right? Or in my or isn't, you know, picking up my, my, my recommendation, right? And so all of us, right, when we're leading others, when we're working with others, we have the ability to create a sense of predictability and control, right? When people are coming into a meeting saying, hey, this, we're going to be here for 20 minutes and we're going to, here's the agenda, right? When you walk into a meeting, you know what the agenda is and you know how long the meeting is, it's not a bad, it's bad a meeting, right? Um, and maybe it's actually one that we get more work done. Right. And if you think about just basic courtesy, it's basic courtesy communications. Right. And this comes in home life, too. My wife is home. If she comes home late from work. Right. Let's say she comes home at six o'clock and all of a sudden it's six oh five and she's not home. What happens? Right. All of a sudden I'm worrying and six ten. Where is she? And, you know, all of a sudden I hear a siren and all now. Right. And now I'm, I'm not really focused on being where I am in the moment. Right. I'm caught up in all this stuff because there wasn't predictability there. Right. But if she calls and says, hey, I'm going to be home late tonight because I got to go stop it somewhere. Right. All of a sudden now, whatever consciousness I had worrying about that I can now be here. Right. And I can be with my daughter or with my family or whatever it is that I'm working on in the moment. And so if we think about just communicating, right, communication, 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 when we communicate what our plans are with others, right, when we communicate to others what we're doing and we give our team, right, control, right, here, this is what I think, what do you think? Or, you know, you give them some choices. What you're doing is you're creating the conditions now where they're going to be able to execute more effectively, whatever their, whatever their task is. Because again, they just have one less thing to worry about, right? So when we look at these programs that are taking care of the, you know, an active duty member's family, right? Right, that's, that's a distraction for someone, right? For no matter what kind of job you do, right? If you have to worry about your family, Right? If there's active things to be concerned about, you're not going to do your job as well. Right? You're not going to be able to exercise that attentional control. So uh, what I would invite us to do is to think about that when we are, um, whether we're leading ourselves, our own families, our communities, right, in your job, um, if we can provide safety, predictability, and control in the external environment. Right? Um, and if you look at, you know, one of the things that, um, I know I'm running out of time here, but one of the interesting things about the military right, is how, every, how predictable everything is, right? You know who everybody is because their name is on their shirt. You know what they're, you know, how they're related to you, right? They're, you know what you're going to wear in the morning. There's a sense of predictability that allows things to operate more efficiently, right? And so that there isn't more, you know, and so um, I would just invite us to um, think about ways that we can bring that into our own lives, right? How can I be more predictable for myself, right? But then also for my family and for, you know, those that I lead at my job. So, um, and then really, 
gratitude uh, ultimately creates the ability for us to connect and work with others as well, right? All these tools really are just going to allow us to connect and collaborate. Um, so that's us. That's Veterans Yoga Project. Uh, it's an organization I started 10 years ago. We uh, delivered 26,000 yoga visits in 2019. A uh, little bit weirder to count that in 2020 because half of it was online. Um, but what we do is we train veterans and active duty and their families how to use these tools to be more resilient, right? And although our niche as a clinical psychologist, my niche was really in treating veterans with post-traumatic stress and other trauma-related disorders, we've really grown now where we're working more with folks who might not be dealing with any mental health issues, but are really focused on resilience and giving back to others. So uh, I guess this is not going to work anymore. I think I only had one slide left anyway. Um, messing with it in there. Um, but that is all I have. Um, you can reach out to me, Dan at veteransyogaproject.org. Go to veteransyogaproject.org. We have several hours of yoga every day. We have 15 minute breathing practices and meditation practices that are live taught by veterans and their family members and some civilians. Um, and we provide yoga teacher training for veterans. And our newest program is a mindful resilience for compassion fatigue program for the caregivers of those who are dealing with issues um, and working with veteran families, as well as the social workers and clinicians that are out there dealing with uh, those who are dealing with significant mental health issues. So with that, um, I am very grateful. Thank you guys uh, for being here and for being so attentive and engaged. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions or observations.